Hi, this is Jeff Van West for Aviation Consumer and AvWeb, and this is a Cessna TTX. Before we take it up to put it through its paces, here's Jeremy Schrag of Cessna Aircraft to tell you a little bit more. Uh, we are standing in front of the new Cessna T240 TTX, formerly known as the Corvallis, or the, uh, when Columbia owned it, it was this, the uh, Columbia 400. And it is the fastest uh, production uh, single engine piston on the market. And we're talking in the flight levels. We're looking at about 235 knots true. Uh, in the mid-teens, we're looking about 210 true. And then in the single digit altitudes, you're looking about 180 to 185 tr true airspeed. We are actually looking at, uh, at about six hours of endurance uh, at 17 gallons an hour. A little, uh, slightly less than that at 22 gallons an hour if you're running a rich side of peak. The TTX hosts other improvements, but the big deal is the G2000 avionics suite, called Intrinsic by Cessna, with its 14-inch screens and a touchscreen controller between the front seats. We wasted no time using it after startup to get the AC cranking against the midday Wichita heat. I like the environmental control system, and I just, air compressor is on, so when I turn the ECS on, the whole thing will come on. And it's in the auto mode, so we'll start feeling some cold air coming through here in just a minute. The interface is similar to Garmin's Pilot app, or the new GTN navigators, but fully integrated into the aircraft systems. Here's how we loaded frequencies for Wichita. See, I want to go on, I want, uh, actually want tower. I'm going to put it on the active. And I'm going to put the departure frequency, which is, I happen to know, is 134.5. So I'm going to put it in standby. And I'll put ground over here after a while. You can also punch in numbers by hand, like, say, your transponder code. Number 240, Chile Alpha. Number 240, Chile Alpha, is that correct? And did you say you had information problem? Tearing ourselves away from the video game, we took a look outside for some actual flying. TTX performance is similar to a Cirrus SR22, but has a more positive, sporty feel due to push rods rather than cables and all but the rudder control. It's still docile and slow flight, and rock stable for instrument approaches, which is where the G2000 really shines. Okay, back to the video game. Here's Jeremy Schrag talking through the setup of an instrument approach. We are now to runway 3-1, so it's an LNAV plus diesel wrap advisory line path right there. And I'm going to go ahead and show the chart there. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. I'm pushing in on this button right here, and it gives us a little icon. Right there. Now I'm going to joystick down. I'm just going to get an idea. We're headed eastbound, so I'm going to pick Kulot as our initial. So, here it's like Kulot. Strong went on to enter our minimum altitudes for the approach, so we'd get a warning when we reached it later on. The system can also accept custom crossing restrictions and user defined holds, and the entire profile, both vertical and lateral, can be flown by the autopilot. If you get a frequency change, as we did, right in the middle of the process, you can pause and punch in the new frequency. Six and transfer. And the city center, good afternoon. We're balanced to 4 0 Kelly Alpha, 1 2,000, 205 to 1 3,000. Speaking of warnings, the system let us know we were passing through 12,000 feet and we might want to put on some oxygen. Luckily, the TTX is a built-in pulse oximeter, which, after some time at 13,000 feet to prove we got 195 knots true, showed it was time to come back down. That was a good reason to try out the TTX's speed brakes. Holding 167 knots indicated, the boards added about 800 feet per minute down to our descent. Just to be clear, the PFD and MFD are not touch sensitive. Only the control screen between the front seats is, where it acts as both a control system for the MFD and a third information screen. The PFD has a set of controls under the glare shield that you'd only use if the touch screen failed or to set the altimeter. The autopilot controls also live under the glare shield. The MFD can be set up split screen to show two pages of data at once, like this chart and flight plan for an instrument approach. Over on the PFD, you can see that the autopilot is flying all the turns and step downs for us. All we need to do is adjust the power. So now we've captured that VNAV to take us on down to Hoville. Once we cross Hoville, our glide path will appear here automatically. And we've already armed it, so we'll capture once it gets centered there. Landing lights are on, and now we just fly the approach. Looking inside or outside, you can see a virtual or real runway grow as you approach. 
Given that head-down temptation, it's a good thing that traffic's integrated into the display with call-outs for your attention. And that's traffic on the runway? That is. Uh, not on the runway, but it's holding short. I, I saw them earlier. Right. Traffic, 12 o'clock, low, less than one mile. There you go. When it's time to go around, you can push the go around button and add power. The autopilot can take it from there. And then I'm just going to go nav mode, and I'm going to go flight level change. And looky there, I'm at VY, I'm just going to leave it right there. 6160 Juliet to runway 31. After the approach, the TTX made us look good on a couple landings. 3,000 foot runways would be no problem. Shorter would be fine with good speed control and less than the full 1,000 pounds of useful load. Minimum. If you want to take one of these aircraft home, it's going to set you back somewhere between $700 and $750,000, or maybe a little bit more depending on options. But you get a lot of airplane for that money. If you want to find out more, you can check out the August issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine or Cessna's website. I'm Jeff Van West for Aviation Consumer and AvWeb. Thanks for watching.